At Northrop Grumman, innovation isn't just an idea. It's a way of life. The value of performance. Northrop Grumman. My name is Parag, and I was a professor at Georgia Tech where I studied music and music intelligence, which is basically trying to teach computers to think and to listen, and not only to listen, but to create. And that led me to eventually a career in creating music technology. Eventually, I became chief scientist at Smule, where we made apps such as Magic Piano, Otter App, IMT Pay, and Songify. So you might have heard of some of these things. A couple of years ago, I, I wanted to serenade my wife, and uh, I made this little video on YouTube that, that went viral. And you know, I'm, I'm a pretty bad singer, and I wanted to make a technology that would help guys like me sound, sound better. So I created something called La Di Da. And I'm gonna demonstrate that for you right now. I'm warning you, it's, it's, I'm, I'm definitely a bad singer. But here we go. Here I am singing very badly in public. There is a point to this horrible singing. You will know at the end why I've subjected you to this. For now it's all. All right, so that's pretty bad. Let's, let's see what happens. Here I am singing very badly in public. There is a point to this horrible singing. You That's the power of math. Now, you may be wondering how math led me down this path. Like many of you, I was always interested in math and science, and really more fundamentally, the patterns and structures that we see all around us. And there was something in particular that drew me to math. It had a power. You know, you can prove something once, and you can apply it in an infinite number of ways. So it gives you a very, very powerful tool for analyzing the world and for creating new things. At the same time, I've always been sort of powerfully drawn to music. I, some of my earliest memories are about listening to music. When I was growing up in a small uh, apartment in Yonkers, New York, you know, my parents had recently immigrated and we had one small radio uh, in the house. It was in their bedroom. And it's not like today where we have a device with us at all times and we can basically listen to music anytime, anywhere. Music was much more you know, limited. And so I remember sneaking into my parents' room and you know, listening to the radio for hours. In high school, you know, I used to spend days in the basement with my best friend just recording sounds and manipulating sounds. And along the way, I played some piano and, and mandolin. And I think what drew me to music was this idea that it's really an exploration of yourself. It's a way to go inwards and to explore what's inside, and not only that, but also to commune with others. It's one of the most powerful means for having shared experiences. And I always thought that my two passions, music and math, were gonna kind of be separate. And I think probably a lot of you guys, you know, you have something that you're probably good at at school, and then you have another thing that you're really into, that, you know, video games or whatever it is that you think, ah, oh, this doesn't really have anything to do with, with what I'm studying, but I'm really into it. You know, how do I bring these two things together? And for me, it was kind of the same way. I went to Yale to study mathematics, and I thought these were just gonna be two different threads in my life that I would just kind of pursue. And I was very fortunate to stumble upon a class in computer music. And at that time, I had no idea that there was a field that allowed you to combine music and math and looked for the fundamental connections between them. At the same time, 
I was getting really intensely into something called Indian classical music, and this is an instrument that I play. It's called a sarod. It's a fretless, plucked instrument. And you know, I w at that time I was just listening to Indian music. I wasn't performing, and there was something that really moved me about it. And I decided I wanted to not just pursue it as a listener, but I wanted to actually pick up an instrument and play it. So I decided to leave school. I, I took a year off from Yale, and I went to India. And I kind of wandered around, because actually I didn't have a deep knowledge of the Indian classical music scene. And so I went from city to city looking, looking for a teacher, looking for a mentor. And eventually I was very fortunate to, to have the, be mentored and to be taught by one of the legends of Indian classical music, Pandit Bhadadev Das Gupta. Now you might be wondering at this stage, okay, I've said that there's music and there's math, and I, I found out that they're connected, but really how are music and math connected? What is the real connection? And what's interesting is that we have never found any human culture which does not have music and dance. Think about it. From the rainforests of the Amazon, from the highlands of Indonesia, from Central Europe to the tip of South America, people have music and dance. And it's not like food. You know, it's obvious that, okay, every culture has food. You need food to survive. Why is it that we all enjoy music? Why is it that music is such a fundamental part of our lives? And what's interesting is not only is music something universal to humans, but it seems that we've been using technology for as long as we've been making music. So these are pictures of bone flutes that we've found in caves from 50,000 years ago, and we're still cavemen. So that's kind of amazing, is that for as long as we've been making music, we've also been shaping the world around us in order to help us make music. So there's a fundamental connection between technology and music, and that's not something that started with electronics or with computers. It goes way, way back. And you know, it's probably even before we were able to find archaeological evidence, you know, people were probably stretching leather over like hollowed out stumps to make drums, and we're probably singing way before that. So the point is that technology and music have always gone together. And if you even think of things that we think of traditional instruments, like a piano, a piano is a mechanical wonder. It's a super complicated way of making music, and in a way, it's the first auto-tune. You press a button, it makes a sound. And if the piano is tuned, it's always in pitch, uh, as opposed to the voice where uh, you start singing, and, oh, I got a frog in my voice, something, something is going wrong. So music and technology have always gone together, but there's an even deeper connection between music and mathematics. And I want to illustrate that with an example. So I'm going to play a little game with you guys. I'm going to play four short music clips. And after each clip, I want you to tell me what the genre of music is. Classical, not hard, okay. Very good. Techno, right? Rock, okay. So this wasn't a very hard quiz. You got 100%, gold stars for everyone. Um, but actually, that's interesting, because what do we know about music? Music is supposed to be about harmonies and melodies and rhythms, and how long were these clips? A second, actually they were all less than a second in length. So that's pretty interesting. How is it that our brain is able to analyze one second of music and immediately identify the genre? What's going on here? It's kind of like magic because all the things we were taught that music is about, it's not really present in a clip of music that's less than one second long. So in order to understand what's, what's happening here, it's useful to take a little bit of a detour. So imagine you're hitting a drum. Okay, what, what is sound? What's going on? Music is eventually sound. And what is sound? Sound is caused by vibrating objects, right? So when I hit a drum, that drum starts to vibrate. And it actually turns out that the drum vibrates in a very complicated way. When you pluck a string, it has its own ways of vibrating. But in all the cases, what happens is that it's vibrating in a medium, let's say air. And when it vibrates, it collides with the air molecules. And when it collides with the air molecules, those molecules come together, they're compressed, and then they go apart, they're rarefacted. So we, this process of compression and rarefaction creates a pressure wave in the medium, in this case, air. And you can see that it looks like it's radiating outward. Now, each of those individual molecules is actually not moving anywhere, it's just oscillating locally, it's going locally. But still, just as with all waves, the energy is being transferred. So that's what's happening with a sound wave. A really amazing thing happens when the sound wave reaches your ear. So it comes in your ear and it goes to the middle ear, and then you have this part in the middle called your eardrum, your tympanic membrane, it starts vibrating. You know, just like those air molecules were vibrating, it starts vibrating sympathetically to the sound wave. 
Then you have these three small bones, actually the smallest bones in your body, and they start vibrating another thing called the oval window, which creates the wave inside your inner ear. Your inner ear is sealed, and it's filled with fluid. And that creates a wave in there. And then a kind of amazing thing happens. Inside your inner ear is something called the cochlea, and there's something called the basilar membrane. And what it's actually doing is it's taking this sound wave, and it's mathematically analyzing the sound wave into something that we call sinusoid. Now, you guys probably know or maybe have bad memories of like, you know, trigonometry class where you got a triangle inside a circle and something about cosine and sine. And, you know, what does that have to do with music? So here's an amazing thing. Basically, anything you can hear, any sound waves, really actually any waves can be represented as a sum of sinusoids. So that makes this mathematical function, which is really abstract, extremely powerful. Because what it means is that we can break down these complicated waveforms into something much simpler. We can create an X-ray of the sound. So we can take these little chunks of sound, do this analysis, which is inspired by and similar to what your brain is doing, and get a picture. And this quality of sound is what we call timbre. It's the texture of the sound. It's the thing that's not captured by melody or harmony or, or rhythm, although it's related to those things. It's the quality of sound. It's what makes something, say, sound rough and what sound makes something sound smooth. And that's something we can see by doing this kind of analysis. Now, I want to give you another example. So imagine you're in the cafeteria sitting with your friends and stuff's happening, you know, forks are falling, uh, you know, somebody's chow chowing down on a hamburger and you're trying to you know, hold a reasonable conversation. Now, how is it that you're able to hear the person next to you? Now, it seems kind of like trivial, like, duh, I'm just listening. The person's next to me, I pay attention. What's the big deal? So I'm going to play an example, and I want you to tell me what's being said. So there's some background noise that starts, and then I say something over the background noise. I'll be your virtual friend. And I want you to tell me what I'm saying. Who makes the best pizza in New York? Right, so what did I say? Who makes the best pizza in New York? Who makes the best pizza in New York? Any can? OK. So. What's going on here? Why is this an interesting problem? So imagine everybody that's speaking in the room is like a pebble that you threw into a lake. Now what happens when you throw a pebble into a lake? It makes ripples, right? And now what if you throw like 100 pebbles? There's lots of ripples. And what happens? They all combine together. Now imagine at the end of that lake, you have something which is just measuring, you know, it's just sitting, resting lightly on the surface of the water and it's bobbing up and down. Okay? And now, based on the pattern of that, I ask you, what's going on in the lake? Are people swimming? Did a bird fly there? Did someone throw a rock? What's going on? And you probably like, you know, you're crazy. There's no possible way I can tell you, based on this little thing bobbing up and down here, what's going on in the lake. But here's the amazing thing. Not only are we doing that, but we're doing that in three dimensions. That's what your auditory system is doing all the time. Now, how is this possible? Well, it goes back, again, to mathematics. Your auditory system is, again, taking this complicated, mixed-up waveform, and it's like, boom. It's taking an x-ray, which is allowing us to separate out things and to see the individual components. And that's not enough. Your brain is on top of that. It has a lot of exposure to things in the world. So it kind of knows what voices sound like and what things falling sound like and what beating on a rock sounds like. And so what it does is it matches it with patterns that it's learned. So it takes this x-ray, it matches it with the patterns, and it's able to find out, OK, who's the person talking? What was the stone falling? It groups these things together. And that's how we're able to make sense of the world. If we weren't doing this x-ray, this mathematical analysis, and then this learning, the world would be, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to just be this crazy jumble. Creating this kind of representation that's easier to understand, that's the fundamental insight that allows us to create machines that do something similar. After college, I moved to Stanford where I did my PhD, and I did an interdisciplinary PhD in, in music and mathematics. And my special area was something called machine learning. And machine learning is where we try and get computers, as I said before, to learn from their environment, to listen, to see, these kinds of things that we find really, really easy to do, but are the product of millions of years of evolution. Turns out that it's really, really hard to do that. And that eventually led me to create certain technologies that 
how to make it easier to make music. So one of the things that we, one of the types of music I love is rap music. And I was interested in, can we turn speech into rap? So I'm gonna show you an example of what that means. All right, who wants to hear something rap? Who's got a phrase for me? Anybody? Don't be shy. Science is cool, that's good. Second, second line? All right, let's, let's do science is cool, okay. Sorry. Don't be a fool, science is cool. Science is cool. Don't be a fool. 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 Science is cool. Cool. Don't be a fool. Science is cool. 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 Science is cool. Okay. Don't be a fool. There we go. Science is cool. Okay. So what's going on here? So this technology is again. I keep hammering home the same point. It's based on this fundamental idea that you can take something complicated, analyze it into simpler components, and then compare it, find the patterns within that. So that's actually what voice recognition does. So when you, let's suppose you're calling up your bank or any of these things and you know, it says, okay, what's your social security number or whatever it is. What's happening is that it's analyzing your voice. It's doing that kind of x-ray representation that I showed you. The next thing it's doing is it's saying, Okay, I've got this picture, and I've learned what all these words sound like. Not just what they sound like, but what they look like. And what I'm gonna try and do is find a match. And that's essentially what we're doing here. We listen to your voice, we try and find a match so that we can break it up into the syllables you're saying. Now think about, you know, if you're a rapper, I guess some of you guys probably like rap music and probably rap yourselves. What are you doing when you're rapping? How, how is rapping different than just talking? You're doing it to a beat. Now, what does it mean to speak to a beat? How do you do that? How do you think you do that? Correct. The basic idea is that you want to align your syllable with the beat. Maybe one to one, or two to one, or three to one, like Kendrick Lamar loves to do three to one. Some people like to do just one to one. It really just depends on what style of rapping you're doing. But the idea is that you want to make it even. So what we do is we first analyze it into syllables. Now when you're talking, your syllables are not necessarily all the same length. They don't line up to any kind of grid. So what we then do, after we've broken it up into syllables, is that we stretch or shrink what you've said to match a rhythmic grid. And in doing so, it makes it sound like you're up. I want to conclude just by saying that I never really had a grand plan like, okay, you don't, when you're seven year old, think, you know what I want to do? is correct bad singer. You, you know what I really want to do is, I want to turn speech into rap. But somehow that's where my path led. It was a very serendipitous journey, and I think what was key to that is that you gotta follow your loves, you gotta follow your passions. There were many, many points along the way where people told me, you're insane, you just got a degree from Yale in mathematics, and now you're gonna go study computer music? Like, have you lost your mind? Why don't you do something more practical? Or, you know, you're studying music and people are like, well, you know, you're too old to do that or you're too old to do this. The point is that if you really believe in something, if you really care about it, you're gonna overcome all the obstacles. You're gonna go deeper than the next person. And it's not about where you start, it's about where you end up. And so I think, you know, follow your passions, follow your loves, they lead to unexpected places. But if all along the way, you're doing what you believe in, you're gonna be a happy person. Thanks.